Hidden Object Guru here, joined by... The Gun Wrangler. Who's going to teach me how to play hot new game of two years ago, Vermintide 2. Uh, yeah, I, I played the first one, but this is uh, entirely new for me, so I'm pretty excited. Oh, uh, in case you're wondering, hey, why does the game look like garbage? Well, funny story. Uh, Vermintide was not able to detect my system hardware. So it's like, we're just going to auto, uh, automatically set it to lowest possible settings uh, because we cannot detect your system hardware at all. So uh, good luck. And that, ooh, I've got lamp oil. I assume I can throw this and set it on fire? Yep. Okay. Oh, that was a bad guy? That's why I shot them in the face. Okay, I was, I was worried. Sometimes you shoot um, innocent people. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not, it hasn't, you know, it's not crazy to say that's something you might do. It, it, it's not, yeah. Offhand, it's not. Yeah, it's not out of the realm of possibility is what I'm trying to say. Okay, yeah. oh, dang. So, all right, as usual, we're here to talk about a thing, and this week's nice thing is Narcos Mexico Season 2. Uh... Uh, we all recall Narcos Mexico. It was the Kiki Camarena story. Mm -hmm. And oof. Things did not go well for Kiki Camarena. I mean, I knew they weren't going to. I'd seen the movie back in the 80s. Uh, I'm trying to remember who played Kiki Camarena. Might have been Stephen Bauer? Could well, have been the other Stephen thing Bauer? is, like, it's even brought up in um, regular Narcos. In regular Narcos, where yeah. they say Kiki Camarena was the patron saint of the DEA. Yeah, because he's the guy who the uh, who was executed by the narcos. And uh, and we yep. were like, well, time to get gloves off after they did that. Which, yeah, and that is largely what this season is about, their attempts to get gloves off with the narcos uh, after that first season and how incredibly questionably it goes. Because, uh, let's just say... This film is very skeptical about the... This film. This series is very skeptical about the Mexican government. Understandably so. <laughs> Understandably so. I don't know why. I wasn't expecting basically an entire season about government corruption. Uh, well, but that's like... largely what the series is about this time. Because it's about their inability to get anything done. Because they can't work with the cops. Because the cops will tell the narcos about them. But at the same time, it's about the narco's frustration with being held back by this political system. Like they'd love to take over, but they, you know, they want to run things. But there's eight degrees of people who are in charge above them, and they know they have all the power because they're, you know, they have all of the drugs and they have all of the guns. They know they have all the power, but they still live within a legal society, so. There are restrictions, and that frustrates them, because they're all, you know, unbelievably arrogant. Well, beyond that, they're all, like, they understand that they act with impunity. Yes. By and large. Oh, yeah. As long as they pay the taxes. Yeah, and that is one of the things that I found interesting, that yeah. they were willing to basically say... One of the reasons why the cartel issue became like they yes. um the reason why the cartels became so powerful was because of government corruption. Yeah, because and, there I mean was, that's how there was no one there to provide services, and there was no one who was loyal to their government, so these guys could just come in and do whatever. Well, beyond that. One of the main factions of the, um, oh, that was nice. Of the current, or well, last generation's cartel war was, um, yeah, the Zetas, which were former Mexican commandos. Yeah. Now they just essentially stopped saying, "Well, why are we fighting for this when we could be? Why are we fighting this and dying for this when we could just be making the money ourselves?" And they went for it. And they were unbelievably effective at it. Uh, yeah. Because they had military training. They had... Uh, they had logist Like, they knew how to run logistics. They had military training. They had military weapons. They were... They upgraded to the point where it was no longer, you know, what we see in the first Narcos. 
guys on, you know, guys in Jeeps and track suits and t-shirts and shorts shooting people out of windows, they acted like it was a military organization. Yeah. I mean, this is something you've seen, like, in the airport ambush, they made it clear that, well, maybe. Oh. Maybe, just maybe, these guys have had some level of military <laughs> training. training. <laughs> maybe they're ready for us this time. I, I wonder if, like, the airport ambush is one of those things, like, so many things in this show you watch and you're like, I wonder how real that is, right? And I wonder if anything like the airport ambush actually happened. You know, because I... I could not track down any information about that. Like, one of the craziest things in the show, which I'll talk about in a bit, did actually happen, only it was even worse in real life. Uh, but this one was just... But that, I'm like... Did that really happen? Was there a gunfight between cartels and the uh, and the DEA on an airport runway? Because <laughs> that maybe seemed like a bit of a stretch to me. I'd be willing to bet, maybe not on an airport runway. Yeah. But that kind of gunfight would be willing to bet good money that that kind of gunfight almost certainly happened. Some sort of multiple gunfights between DEA. And cartels happened, and oh, the DAA, you know, Alphabet Soup wasn't always the winner. That's such a crazy... I mean, because I, I remember, um, right, the, the thing that really messed with people's minds when it happened. I don't remember what year it was. It was when the Zetas were at their worst, so what, mid-2000s? Give or take. That was that famous thing in Laredo where the cartels had a gunfight with the state cops. And they won the gunfight, and the state cops had to flee. That's and every times. it happened a couple of times, but it was the first time. The first time it happened, they were like, "Oh my god, this is." Ne and the the press around it was, and the thinking around it was, it's never happened in American history that like the authorities have lost a gunfight with a criminal gang. Now, of course, that was an exaggeration. There were times in history, especially during bootlegging, when people did actually flee from uh, uh, heavily armed bootleggers and uh, mafia well, figures. Well, just look at the, um, uh, what other face? Oh. Uh, um, Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, yeah, Bonnie and Clyde, who were gunning down cops left and right. But the thing about Bonnie and Clyde was that nor it's not like they were taking on armies of cops. Generally, like, one cop would wave them down and that cop would not be expecting to have four people with machine guns in the car waiting for them. Yep. Whereas, like, an actual situation where you call in reinforcements and have a full gunfight and still lose with the against the criminals, that almost never happens in America, right? And that's um, why this Laredo thing was so shocking. Yeah, it's stuff like you've got... A couple of specific instances. Um, okay, I'm being the told there's Miami, hostiles nearby. Oh, there. It Miami is. Dade shootout in I think it was '89. Um, the North Hollywood shootout in '92. Yeah, these major, major gunfights. But the cops generally win major, major gunfights until they were up against the cartels in this border town. And that's, you know, that's why it messed with people's heads and why the whole war with the cartels has, you know, um, so fixated people in our, fic like, making fiction about it, right? We just keep making stories about it because, oh my god, it feels like they might actually win because they certainly won in Central America and Mexico, is the yeah. thinking. And, I mean, you, you can say you hear about all the political corruption, right? But then you look at the, I mean... The president of Mexico right now isn't in bed with the cartels, but the last guy sure as hell seemed to have been. So... Well, the guy uh, who's currently in charge isn't in bed with the narcos because, like, my understanding is they've essentially um, signed a... Uh, Non-aggression treaty? <laughs> like, they Ooh. won't try too hard to fuck with cartels and yeah. the cartels will stop leaving body yeah. parts all over the place. Well, murdering bus uh, school buses full of students. That was a that was a bad look for them. Yeah. 
that was a very bad look for them the time they did that. And I think what's interesting about that is, I mean, it actually makes sense as a strategy because fundamentally, does it really matter to the government of Mexico? Like, as long as they stop shooting people, I mean, I, I hate to go to the wire the way I always do, but it's like, if they're willing to stop shooting people, should the government really care that these guys are shipping marijuana and cocaine and heroin? Like, fundamentally? Like, does it matter to the government of Mexico that America's getting all of this cocaine and heroin and marijuana? And I think the argument is, ow! Now I got to stop clonked by something. Uh, I think the argument they would say is, no, like, that's America's problem. America's war on drugs is its own problem. And, we, uh, and Mexico wasn't this hellhole before America turned people buying pot into a war on drugs. I mean, Mexico had its problems. It was a military dictatorship for huge amount for like a number of decades. But there were a number of decades last century. <laughs> well, yeah, no, that's what I'm saying. But up until the 70s and the 80s, there wasn't you know paramilitary forces and open warfare with the government all of mm -hmm. the time. That only started when there became huge amounts of money pouring into the country from America because of the drug war. And, and not, I mean, the complete lack of effectiveness of the drug war is a sub-theme of the entire Narcos series. Because it's like all of these guys fighting tooth and nail to, uh, to get these victories, right? And it's like these hard-won victories against brutal opposition. But at the end of the end, every season, it's like, but does anyone have any trouble getting coke in America? Does anyone have any trouble getting pot or heroin in America? No, like, you are fighting the tide at a certain point. And that is this depressing sub-theme of the entire show. I think one part, like, there's a there's an interesting part um, when they capture the former DGI guy. Oh, yeah. And he's like, the main reason why I know everything will be fine is yeah. because you guys aren't willing to go balls to the walls. Yeah. Like... There's five of you here, right? I missed you there. Sorry. Um, so there's five of you I, here. There's five of you here. You have a matter of hours before my guys find you. Yeah. And I've got a lot more guys. Yep. Your government has left you here to die. I know. You should walk away. Oof. Because it's like, when one, and I mean, the argument he's making is, when one side is going to, like, start matters by cutting off the heads of everyone you love, that's, that's where they start. Yeah. Well, then how do you fight that with normal, like, you are, you keep talking about a war on drugs, but you're not willing to treat it like it's a war. Yeah. Right? You, st you claim you're in a war on drugs, and one side is acting like it's a war. But the other side is acting like it's a police ma a matter for the police and a matter yeah. for the courts. We didn't arrest. I mean, we did arrest Nazis and throw them in jail, but we didn't do it while they were holding guns. <laughs> yep. And we sure as hell didn't warn them before we dropped bombs on them. You know, like... and that's that's it's it's this weird thing of you're right. Like this theme of Americans not willing to go all the way. They act like it's they pretend it's a war on drugs, but they don't act like they're fighting a war. So how do you expect to accomplish anything? It's a and rough message. Beyond that, um, you see, you know, America throwing uh, resources piecemeal yeah. into the fight, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They only ever offer them the slimmest bit of support and information. And yeah. then, in addition to the DEA, who is out there doing this job, you've got them constantly being undercut by both the State Department and the CIA, who would rather work with the drug dealers. Is there, is there a better scene in this entire season than, uh, than him get, getting on the, the CIA plane? And it's just like the mo like the the increasing tension of being like, I know it's a terrible idea to get on this plane. Like I know this like every part of him is screaming that it's a trap. Yep. But 
his organization collapses and he's dead if he doesn't get off, if, if it's, if he does, if it's not true. And even though it is a trap, he still manages to talk his way out of it. But it's well, like the other thing moment is... that he knows that like, this is the CIA. They can, they can turn me over to the cops or they can just throw me out of the plane. Like I'm ac- I actually need to be scared of the Americans in this situation. Yeah. To the Americans. Not yeah. as scared as I am of, uh... Like, that was the big thing when the CIA guy basically says, well, well, we can pitch you out of the plane. Maybe we'll just land someplace like, oh, I don't know, Juarez, and just let you out. I know. <laughs> oh, it's such a good scene. Yeah, but I mean, that, that actor's fantastic, and he's been on the show for a while now, playing the sinister head of, uh, uh, of you know, uh, Central America, the CIA, and he's been fantastic in every appearance because you're like, yeah, this guy's a scumbag. We we know what he wants. He's yeah, a manipulative guy... ass, and we kind of love it. Well, he's the war like it's a war, and he's using yeah all of the resources he has. And if his government won't get rid of resources, well, he'll deal with the cartels. Yeah. And that's what it comes down to, like uh, smuggling drugs and guns to Central America. And you know what? If the, the if Reagan's uh, if Reagan's not going to help, he'll use the cartels to do that. Yeah, it's bleak stuff. No, it is it's unbelievably bleak, but like, yeah. But I, I mean, say, now that I've read two of the books, uh, two of the books that this was based on, oof, yeah, no, like you, you understand where they were coming from. You know, that's the crazy part. Like, I understand how it got this far. Okay, well, that was just a brutal slaughter. I was off exploring, looking down for how to lower the cannon, and you guys were killing 30 Skaven. Uh, but yeah, like, it's it's true, and you understand how some of it either was or at least felt necessary at the time. I'm not going to say I approve of their actions, but given the circumstances they were in, I know why they did it, and... I mean, I know this is the manipulation of the show, but... Uh, the runner it's just a... yeeted himself at me. No! Oh, damn, that's what that tackle is. Okay. Yeah. All right, I not wondered what happens when I get knocked over. Um, are we supposed to drop the cannon, or... Oh, we can lower the cannon. Okay, good. Now we just have to turn the cannon so it uh, faces that thing. Oh, I thought we were going to shoot down the door. We went that a different way. <laughs> that would have made a lot more sense. Uh, yeah, but, and of course you've got the conflicting egos among the, the narcos and people unwilling to, under any circumstances, let a slight go. Or, yeah, like, look at the exchange between Chapo and those other guys. Oh my god. Which, by the way, something that bothered me about Chapo is you're translating this all from Spanish. Yep. His name is Shorty. His name isn't Chapo, it's Shorty. They already had a Joaquin, so we'll call you Shorty. And and part of the bizarre irony of this man is that he became that a guy named Shorty became the most feared, you know, drug kingpin in Mexico, while all the while everyone is calling him Shorty. Yeah. And they by not translating the subtitle to Shorty, you lose that aspect of the character that I find so interesting. I know, Thought but that was a you also had to leave it recognizable to the modern American viewer. I guess you're right, but, you know, people are still going to be saying Chapo. It's just going to be translated as Shorty. Uh-oh. I need an adult. What, what is that? What, what is it? What are we looking for? I got a leech on me. A leech? Yep. Oh, Never. damn. I didn't know they could do that. Oh, love my special move. Homing arrow nonsense. Okay, I'm out of ammo, so I'm going to have to sword guy, which, as you can see, is not my first. Fire. Nice. Seems like a safer bet. Yeah, no. And thank God there's no, uh, what do you call it? And thank God there's no uh, friendly fire damage, because I would not be doing well the amount of times I spend running into your guys' grenades. Yep. But, uh, yeah, yeah, but so... But no, that, like, when Chapo, you know, does a thing in an area where he's not supposed to, and it's like, oh, now everybody gets killed. And, like, you know, you just, you sit there think, thinking, uh, well, again, go back to the wire. 
why is it every we can every other business in the world can sell its product without people killing each other and you watch and you're like chapo's got a good idea if people would just listen to him they would move a lot of drugs incredibly safely and make a, and everybody would make a lot of money but they are so dead set on well, I, I was disrespected by someone operating in my field without asking permission. I didn't get, you know, everybody didn't sign. And it's, it's almost like a corporate thing where it's like, no, you had to get eight different supervisors to sign off on your plan. Except unlike in a corporate structure, if you don't get eight, all, all eight supervisors to sign off on your plan, People all of your friends bang. are going to get shot in the head. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the same basic idea that it's like he didn't cross every I and dot every... Uh, cross every T and dot dot every I and now all of his friends are dead. That's a rough one. (laughs) Yeah. I mean... You're not supposed to... You're not supposed to sympathize with Chapo, but, like, at the same time... It's hard not to watching that scene, right? Like... Well, and I think think it's a really strong way the show is constructed that even though... Right, um even though we know who Chapo grows up to be, right? We know what a scumbag this guy grows up to be. The, the, the actor plays it as the guy who is in so far over his head and everyone around him is such a crazy monster that it's like, it's almost hard not to be on this guy's side. Cause he's like, he's a guy who's just trying to sell a product. You know, he's just yep. trying to move up in the world in the field that allows to him. It, uh, that is a, that, you know, that the only way is allowed to him. Because, you know, he can't run for office. Well, the he, other he thing is... go to university. You have these moments like that, and then yeah. you have moments where he's like, yeah, cutting the hand off of someone's mariachi because it's a I know. favorite. I know. Oh, God. Yeah, that's rough. But, I mean, and that's what it comes down to, is they live in this world where violence is so casual and the first resort to every slight and every inconvenience that even a person who we should be sympathetic to is just as awful and brutal as the rest of them. It's, I mean, it's very well done. It is. It's a very I mean, well-made you... show. I mean, I'm just going to say, I'm enjoying Narcos Mexico more than I enjoyed Narcos. Um, I would say I enjoy Narcos Season 1 that I enjoy Narcos Mexico. Okay. Because Narcos Season 1 was really fucking good. Well, no, but I, I mean, Narco Season 1, and I think 2 and 3 suffer because Narco Season 1 is such an incredible ride through, you know, and I mean, they don't even, and I, what I love about the show is they don't mention, and this is one part about the show, but I also kind of loved it, was they don't mention when you're watching Narco Season 1 that, yeah, all of this takes place over 11 years. Like, mm-hmm. from the day he gets arrested, right, um... Uh, to the day he gets arrested and gets the mug shot that proves so pu- pivotal to the plot, to the day he goes and builds his prison, that's 11 years passing. <laughs> and if you're watching the show, you would have no idea that 11 years had passed. Yeah. And, but because they're compressing 11 years of amazing history into just 13 episodes, oh my god, you're right. It's like, it's nothing but gold. Every episode, you're watching the craziest thing you've ever seen, and it's all true. Yep. He blows up an airliner halfway through the series, and it's not the craziest thing that happens. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna want to come over here, man. Oh, okay. On my way. Yeah. There's no sprint button, it seems. No. I, I learned but, um... that the hard way. But yeah, I found that. Uh, are we about to get flooded with enemies? Oh my god. Yeah. I wish I had some arrows. Oh, I, had, I do have arrows. Okay. Uh, grenades, you may want to start using them. I don't. Damn albino skaven. Oh god, this is so freaky. Way to go, flood of enemies. Uh, yeah, it's it's amazing. And, you know, it's like, because later he gives communist gorillas money to take the entire government hostage. And then and like, kills them anyways. And kills them anyways. You know, so no one will be able to testify against him. And he kidnaps celebrities. Like, every single thing that happens, one on top of another. And I mean, yeah, they play with history quite a bit. Um, For example, in real life, uh, 
the Cali cartel did not murder his reporter girlfriend. She's still alive. Also, she yep. probably wasn't as bad as she was in the uh, in the show. She probably yep. wasn't sig- singling out her rival to be murdered by the cartels. But that's why that's why they changed names. Although uh, so people they didn't uh, change the names of is the at the time president of Mexico and his brother, who, in the craziest thing to happen this year. Uh, murdered someone when they were children. Yeah, that was wild. It's like, you're and watching, and I'm like, why am I watching this scene? And you get to the end of it, and you're like, Jesus Christ. Wow. And, like, the other thing is, you're like, okay. Yeah. So, you know, they don't feel bad about killing the maid. Yeah. They feel bad because they might have ruined the rug. Yep. Oh, okay. Now, I did check this up online. I went and I looked at the history. And yes, this did actually happen. Really? Yes, that actually happened. But they changed two things. One, that uh, one thing they changed to make them more culpable. And one they changed to make it less awful. So the thing they changed to make it uh, more culpable is the brothers were like eight and four at the time. Yeah. And the neighbor boy who was 11 was over and playing with them. Mm-hmm. And we have no idea who uh, who, who pulled actually the pulled the trigger and had the gun. But there's a good chance it was the, you know, bully 11-year-old neighbor who actually did it. We don't know for sure, but the older neighbor might have been the culprit. But we don't know for sure. And here's the part they did to make it less awful. The maid was 13 years old. Oh, God. It was a child from, like, you know, the poor part of town who was their live-in maid. Who, you know, essentially, like, was there for room and board because that's a way to move up in society is to be the live-in maid of a rich, uh, well, middle class, not even rich, a middle class family from the time you're 13. But yeah, the real girl was 13 years old. So it's even more horrific than on the show. So yeah, um, that is that I did not know. No, yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> well, that was so crazy. I had to look it up. Um, like I knew I read Killing Pablo. Yeah. And Isn't that, that was that was a very interesting read. Yep. But I wasn't so prepared crazy. for. Yeah. Yeah. Oh god, yeah this this one is this one is even crazy. Like it's even crazier the kind of stuff that happens. Well, not not than blowing up a plane and uh, you know taking over the Congress, but uh, but the election fraud is fa- is amazing. Yep. Wow. The election fraud stuff is just incredible. Yay! Ooh, my weapon was unlocked. I now have a sword and a dagger, not just a sword. Huh? Nice. Huh? You know, I was specifically told by um, Vermintide that we were getting triple uh, experience today, but I'm not seeing it. I'm not going to complain, but it is a little strange. Uh, but yeah, like, and this one, like, because I've seen so many other things about the cartels in Mexico, I was surprised by how much was able to surprise me in this one. Mm-hmm. Like, there's honestly so much I didn't know and so much crazy stuff I'm learning watching it. And all of it's terrible. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I, all, I yeah. mean, It's so please. much more screwed up than you thought. That's exactly what I'm getting at, yeah. <laughs> like, I knew this world was screwed up. And I, and I knew, but, oh my god, it's so much worse. Because you watch in that, um, uh, the first season, right? That horrible scene where, like, they just murder two tourists, right? Who ha- who they don't like the look of in a uh, in a restaurant, mm-hmm. right? And you're like, oh, so this kind of casual brutality, I see how it bleeds out everywhere all the time, and then it gets so mu- like the people who get pulled into their web, you know, <laughs> and yeah. It's so rough to watch. Where it's like you, you can't get away from this. Like if you're in this part of Mexico at this time, 
you can't get away from the brutality, the violence, you can't get away from the criminals. Like, you have no choice to but to be part of this world. It's, uh, and maybe it's not that extreme in real life, but it's, it's pretty crazy. Also, the entire government goes to war with a <laughs> whistleblower. Well, the thing about, um, I would say that this isn't as crazy as it gets. Okay. I should be excited for season three is what you're saying? Well, you just need to look at the news and it's like, today, on the, you know, way to, um, to yes. in, into Mexico City, you know, we found 35 bodies, we think, hanging from bridges. Yeah. We don't know because we're, we're still trying to puzzle them together. Mm. Okay, yeah, you make a strong point there. Right, or oh. I think it was not this election, but the one before. Yeah. Um, outside a polling station, I think it was the Zetas, like, filled a dump truck full of bodies and just dumped it. Just ah. planted it there and like, yep. Okay, that's a rough one to hear. <laughs> this is how it is now. Oh, my God. God. Oh, you can craft weapons. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Nice. So I have Greenleaf's Dranak, a spear, or I can have a sword. Both of which are massively up in power from what I was using so far. So how do I craft things? So let's say I wanted this bow. What would I have to do to craft it? Oh, now it's telling me to salvage items. Alright, I'm a little confused. Um, so you get garbage. Yeah. Yeah, like the gray things. Yeah. And I salvage those. Oh, and then I get the reagents at the top. Yeah. Okay, I understand. Nice. Oh, cool. And, um, by equipment, I've got these, uh, it's weird, because in my salvage screen I have bows. But I can't equip those bows in the real, in the game. Oh, those are, much. um... Is because they're too high level for me? No, those are options, and they're usually garbage. So... No, no, I've got a more powerful bow. A swift bow, power 27, ammunition, up to 49 uh, uh, things I can keep. Right-click to equip. Oh, no. Oh, no, no, what I'm saying, when I go to my equipment screen, they disappear. Oh, no. okay, I'm an idiot. They were in the... All right, well, all right, we're just not going to pretend that didn't happen. I didn't realize it wasn't showing all of my equipment, and it was just showing my uh, uh, my melee. All right, that's embarrassing. Thank you for not making too big a deal out of that. Mm -hmm. That was really bad. Uh, so yeah, um, this is. I gotta say, this is kind of boss. The game, or yeah, the, the game, obviously. Oh well, you know how I feel about the series. Uh, yeah, no, the game is kind of boss. I mean, I like the first one, but this one is really amping things up. So, uh, pick us a second short mission for us to go through. Alright. Yeah, I'm interested to see how this goes. There we go. Got my bow. 99 shots! Damn! I'm ready to go. Should be good. Yeah, like, I'm, I'm very happy with just... All of the developments this year, especially... It's it's funny because I was watching uh, Crime Story, right? And, uh, you know, that's about the mob in Vegas. Yeah. And a lot of crazy stuff happened. I mean, it's funny because it's actually telling the exact same story as uh, the movie Casino did. Mm -hmm. Like the first st season of... Uh, Oh, wow, I didn't realize I could rapid-fire arrow. I've been clicking way too much. Well, I'm a little embarrassed now. Uh, the first season is the exact same story as Casino, and the interesting thing about it is is that uh, Michael Mann, right, met uh, the guy who plays Polly on the show yeah. uh, when he was doing Thief, and that's who the character in Thief is based on. I did not know that. Yeah, and basically he knew the actual, uh, you know, Jimmy the Ant, the guy that... Um, uh, oh god, I'm trying to remember who Joe Pesci... What they called the character in... Uh, Casino? Uh, Joe Pesci's character in Casino. Whatever he was called, right? Uh, the real guy was Jimmy the End, and he knew 
you know, he knew Jimmy the Ant really well and he worked together. And like all of this, uh, like this whole show was based on stories he told Michael Mann and the writing staff about Jimmy the Ant and how crazy he was and just what a psycho he was and mm-hmm. how he was this, this crazy monster. And that's what I was thinking about when I was watching season two of these guys who get this amount of power and they they can't help but be, you know, go nuts with it. And like, all these people, if they could just get over their issues, if they could just come to a any kind of understanding with anyone, everybody would be making trouble, uh, making money, no one would have any trouble. But they all have these slights and have these frustrations with each other. And they can't just, I mean, it's right in the first season how he only becomes the head of this cartel because the what the rest of the guys want to form a cartel and his boss doesn't want to form a cartel so all right well we'll get rid of the boss but when all of these people have these insane egos well of course they can't hold it together for any length of time it only makes sense that it's going to collapse under its own weight because these guys they're all used to being the king of something and especially when you get the guys around Tijuana who have been the kings of things for generations. Yeah, like the Don Juan guy. Yeah, exactly, right? Where it's like he's his family's been running things forever. So, of course he feels like they should keep running things forever. Like, they can't accept the, like, obviously pooling their resources is going to mean they can, well, I mean, to look at any corporation, you buy it, he- you are able to buy it wholesale, and you're able to ch- to pick your own price to sell if you control everything. Obviously, everyone's going to make a ton more money if you just shut up and become part of the cartel. But they can't do it. Well, like, beyond that, it's a matter of control. And, like, yeah. all these guys perceive control through the lens of their ego. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Is, oh, it's not a matter of them um, just, you know, being like, okay, well, there's this slight. Yeah. Slight is viewed as a challenge to control, and the only way to establish that you are in control is generally torture or murder or both. Torture, murder. Yeah. Oh, God. And then we got to see get, kids get murdered and thrown off a bridge. Yeah, that was... Quite upsetting, I won't lie. Yeah! I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, you feel like it's coming, but you're not ready for it. And I don't think anything could have gotten me ready for that scene. Oh, that that was a rough one to watch. Oh my god. Uh, But yeah, and part of the fun was, like, I had already read books about um, Pablo, right? I knew a lot of the outlines of the Pablo Escobar story. But before watching Narcos Mexico, I've only read books after watching the show, right? So I had no idea what was coming for most of this story. And yeah. that's what made it so... I mean, that's I think what, that's why it hit me harder in a lot of ways, even though I can see what you mean about Narcos being the stronger story for that first season. I, I, I totally get what you mean, and I think you're even right, but it's like, this one hit me so much harder because I didn't know any of the story to start with. Right? And so it's this bias of the novel, right? Like, I have, yeah. I'm completely, I'm encountering all of this insanity for the first time, and I'm like, wow. But yeah, it's it's a great season. I just think it's a great season of television. It is a fantastic season of television, but like, yeah. I just think that one of the main issues with the series is that it's so consistently good. Yeah. That... You know, you always set the bar really, really high. That's true. And I mean, after, and I will admit that it's like, I enjoyed watching season two and three of Narcos, but it's not, they're not as good as season one. You know? And if you're holding this, and I guess it's possibly because I'm so far away from season one, right? That uh, I can't, I'm not going to have the same reaction. But also, and I think this is part of it, um... Maybe, maybe I'm just, uh, maybe this is just me. Maybe nobody else feels this way, but it's like, you don't have anybody on the cop side. 
as interesting and charismatic as Pedro Pascal was those first two seasons. Well, did he make an appearance again? Uh, no, he did. Uh, wait, no, I don't think he turns up. I think he did, as one of the FBI guys. Did he? I'm trying to remember. Hmm. Um, I can just look it up in a second. But the point is, yeah, like... Look it up after this horde. Yeah, look it up after this horde. I'll just check if Pedro Pascal showed up in Narcos, Mexico. Oh my god. There's so many of them. By the way, did you know that there's a... There's a Narcos video game? Yeah. Yeah, it's XCOM, but Narcos. It's very weird. It is very weird. I, I played and I'm like... Huh. So you can play as Pablo Escobar's goons. Uh, that Skaven has a Gatling gun? Yeah, I mean, you should shoot him. I did. I ran out. I shot him until I ran out of bullets. Okay, so let's look up if Pedro Pascal was. Uh, yeah, I'm was. just going to quickly do that. I'll quickly do that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like the thing is, Pedro Pascal is so good those first two years. And this is nothing against the guy who's... Um, oh, God, what the heck? Scoot McNary, right? He's fine right yeah and he's and he's got a hell of a part to deal with because he's um oh my god uh all right pedro pascal here we go actor game of thrones well soon that'll say actor mandalorian uh that'll be his first uh nope he never showed up on uh, season two unless it was an unbilled cameo oh my god he's playing max lord in the wonder woman movie that's fantastic that is great casting. Way to go. But it's like, he's so good those first two years. And unfortunately, in the third season, which should have been entirely his season, there is, like, comparatively so little for the DEA to do in that third season. Because the third season is largely just about the Cali cartel self-destructing. Yeah. You know? And how, the, like, they only the smallest amount of government pressure was required to make this entire thing collapse. Uh, so, and as a result, he doesn't have much to do that third season the way he does in the first two. And he's so good in those first two seasons, but he's such an amazing presence that you kind of wish you had someone equally compelling heading up uh, Narcos, Mexico. And the fact is, you did in the first season because Kiki Camarena's story is so incredible. Yeah. Like the one guy out there who is pushing this right to the end and he has this horrible end and Scoop McNary's character, he's just a functionary who's there to do a job and it's an important job and I like the way he does it, but there's no depth to his, no real depth to his character. And when they try to bring it in with the story of his drug, like his uh, dead brother who was mur uh, murdered because of his drug addiction and, you know, him wanting to look out for the, the nephew. Like, that's interesting enough, but it's not... You don't... You compelling. can't sink your teeth... Thank you. Yes, compelling. It's just not compelling. We've seen that kind of story before. It's just not that compelling, and you're just not sinking your teeth into it the way you did with how unbelievably... And, I mean, it's sad because you can say, well, we don't know a lot about Pena's inner life either. No, but he's one of our most charismatic actors around at the moment. <laughs> Yep. You know, he's one of the most charismatic actors working. And not, again, nothing against Scoot McNary. He's just not one of the most charismatic actors currently working in fiction. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. Did you watch um, that movie uh, that Pedro Pascal was in? Uh, the, um, the one about uh, Prospect? Prospect. It's called Prospect. About no. space prospectors. You did not I watch that. I did not watch that. It's not great. Uh <laughs> He's, in, it's like... he's getting put into a whole bunch of stuff now. Like, he was in Triple Frontier, which was, as we discussed... Yeah. Iffy. Oh, wait. We should probably check what the mark on the door is before we start pressing buttons, right? Okay, so that'll open the cross door. The iron cross-looking door. Is there an iron cross in the door symbol? No. Oh, they all have the same symbol on them. Okay, I thought there would be clear symbols near the doors to tell us which one to pull. But yeah, he's, like, getting put in a bunch of stuff. Right, you know, like he showed up in the Equalizer too, when he was in Triple Frontier, and like I said, they just dropped him into Wonder Woman. Like he's getting a lot of work. He was in um, what do you call it, Kingsman two, right? And uh, had a real problem with stealing scenes from the two uh, lead actors in that too, because again, he's 
one of the most charismatic actors currently working. So it's like, I really don't care that much about either of these two guys whenever yeah. Pedro Pascal's on screen. Which provides the movie with kind of a big problem since he's the final boss. It's like, wouldn't it be better if he won, though? Like, I'm kind of more on his side because he at least has a motivation for what he's doing and they're just kind of like, well, we like the system the way it is. Yep. But anyway, so it's like, you without that charismatic lead you're just down to um following the actors and you've got that charismatic lead on the narcos side he's fantastic but the the dea is just not interesting with it and all you can do is well i'm involved with the mechanics of their plans to catch these guys but that's i'm only intellectually getting involved with their half of the story if that makes sense all right so Nomically? Is that a word? Maybe if you've got... Gnomes running around. Yeah. Yeah, because the they're using gnome instead of hermetically sealed. Uh, and it's weird to associate hermits with... Uh... Oh, okay. So now, uh, now we need the... You need the button that looks like uh, a circle with three things coming down. The door with the marks on it was way up here. All right, I'll check what the next one is. Unless that was the last door. Uh-oh. That was the last door. But I've got an executioner here, so... Just All FYI. Right. Oh, I got him. Wow, this new bow is really helping out, so yay me. Oh my god, I can't believe that worked. I used my special attack to kill the Gatling Gunner and killed him with one shot, so... I'm, I'm learning how to play the game gradually. But yeah, he was in this movie, um, what I was saying about him was, if you see the movie Prospect, it's not very good, but it's like it's just Pedro Pascal spending 100 minutes being Malcolm Reynolds from Firefly, you know, with the ridiculously ornate method of speaking. And you're like, you know what? Very few other actors would you be willing to watch do that for 100 minutes because it's so preposterous. You have to have someone of his caliber of charm. And that's what you're getting in those first two seasons of Narcos, that whatever the uh, DA is doing, well, I get to watch Pena do it, so yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. And this season, it just doesn't have that. And that's the, that's the thing I like the least about the season is, because I can tell you, okay, Scooby McNair is the lead. I can't tell you one thing about one other member of his gang of DEA agents. Yeah. Like, not one thing. And that's, I think that's a problem. You know? It's... I mean... How are you supposed to follow up that casting, though? That's true. Yeah, you're absolutely right. What is a bile troll? He, he looks pretty unhappy. Alright, I set him on fire, but I'm out of arrows, so just FYI. Ah, damn! Acid thrower. I hate them so. But anyway, you're, uh, what were you, uh, you were saying? I hate up that casting though right yeah and i guess that's what uh, what it comes down to is it's like you're just you're not going to be able to blow people the way you did last time you'd have to make one hell of a discovery to blow people away the same way you did last time and i guess it just didn't happen what does a loot die oh it helps with our loots oh okay so it makes us more oh it makes us more likely to roll better loot and that's why it's called a loot die yeah okay now i understand this is so creepy. This, oh, God. I mean, I know it's Warhammer, and so grit and grim and gore is what it's for, but wow. Like, all of these guys with their oh, severed limbs. All of them covered with filth to start with. It is... Ah, oh, it looks fantastic. And I'm playing on the lowest possible settings. You were saying, sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Whew. All right, I got it, I got it, I got it. All right, I'm back to you. All Still right. got no arrows, but uh, feeling better about my chances without all the arrows. Oh, hey, if you don't have any arrows, can you still do your special attack, which is arrow-based, or no? Probably not. Ah, foiled. Actually, let's find out. 
let's wait until there's like five guys on screen. So yeah, what are you expecting to see? I mean, you know, may, you definitely know a little more about this history than I do. Now that uh, now that the cartel has kind of broken up, and uh, you know he's in jail, they're doing a season three. Where do you think it's gonna go? I think it's gonna follow uh, Chapo and the As he uh, fallout up. of the. Um... The Jalisco uh, cartel and the Federation and all that. So my question is, because we're still like in the late '80s in this timeline, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the do you think that because I mean all the Chapo stuff doesn't go down until the like the obviously he built up. I mean it was the uh, it was it was a long process building up his Gulf cartel. Yeah. Right. Um, and so my question is. Is it going to be a, a situation like the first season where the third season is relatively contained because Camarena, like all that stuff happened over a year and a half or something yeah. like that? Yeah. What's that? No, that's that's exactly it. Because we have... Um, we have Kiki Camarena as this self-enclosed thing, yeah. which leads to... The bigger story of yeah. the cartel. And that's my question to you. Do you think the next... Oh, do we have to jump down there? Yeah. Oh, come on. Really? Oh, don't feel good about this. Um, I don't have an arrow, so I can't set that off. Oh, you're doing it for me. No, you're not. Oh, yeah, you have. I forgot how long it takes those things to detonate. Yeah. Oh, just die um, already. Oh, shit. There's a slaver. What is the slaver? Oh, those are the ones who grab you by the neck like the smokers yeah, from... Like uh, that. Yeah. Would you mind killing him um, so he doesn't? I'm coming! I'm coming! I'm coming! Take off with me. If I had, if I had any arrows, this would go a lot better. But I don't. All right, he's dead. Sorry. Oh, ammo! Thank God. No, you took it. Uh, anyway, where was I? Yeah. So I guess you're right. Like the the Camarena story gets us into. I'm getting leeched. The cartel. So oh my God! These guys. I need to find some ammo. Um. So it, to here. me, I would suspect, right, that our next season... Oh, okay, ammo. All right, I'm fully loaded, 100 bullets. Let's do this. Yep. Uh, I would assume that next season, they might open up the storytelling the way they did the first season of Narcos and tell the big, sprawling story of the Gulf Cartel. Uh, I would say it's going to follow the Jalisco Cartel, which is its predecessor. Okay. And then it falling apart in the early 2000s. Right. Eventually. And then moving to, um, yeah, the formation of the Gulf Cartel as the end point of the third season. Okay. I'd be, and I'm very interested to see how that goes. Uh, so, uh, before we wrap up, do you have anything you would like to recommend people check out? I mean, uh, I'm not going to give any details, but you've had some time to watch some things over the past months. We're all in quarantine. Uh, is there any anything you think people should check out? I mean, even the basics like Session 9, Take Shelter. <laughs> Maybe something to cheer people up. Maybe not the going mad in isolation movies. Maybe yeah. don't just tell people watch The Thing over and over again. Um, uh, I'd recommend uh, Season 2 of The Terror. Oh, God, yeah. Well, we talked about that, and it is magnificent. Yep. Season four of The Which, Expanse. by the way, but how crazy was it when, you know, um, a because we had just watched The Terror, right? Uh, and so I see the news, on the news that the guy in charge of an aircraft carrier, the captain in charge of an aircraft carrier, like, was disgusted by the way he wasn't getting any support and his men were in danger. And so he, like kind of went public with the desire to save his men's lives and it like ruined his career because he tried to help save his men yep. and it's like and he was named captain crozier yeah that was a bit <laughs> on the nose that was an amazing coincidence oh i made a very stupid mistake i'm coming back to you guys oh i've 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 uh aggroed a whole horde of dudes and i'm all on my own because i thought you were behind me and i did not check but yeah, I mean, you can listen to our conversation after you've watched the um, second season of The Terror. It's, sorry, the first season of The Terror. The second season of The Terror, of course, is the one about the um, internment camp, which I'm still waiting to show up on the internet. Uh, well, where I can get it. Yeah. Uh, still not on obtained. Crave. 
Well, yeah, legally obtained. Because it's like, it's still not on Crave. And I'm like, what are you doing, guys? It's been, all, well, it's been the better part of a year. Get it out there. But yes, of course, the new season of, um, yeah, sorry for talking about the first season, but the Crozier thing just struck me as so on point. Uh, but yes, of course, we're going to be back for the uh, season four of The Expanse soon. But first, um, next time you see us, I'm going to be here, uh, and there's no nice way to say this, just like admitting I was wrong for a full hour about Picard. And uh. that no, you shouldn't have given it a chance. So expect Gun Wrangler to do an hour's worth of gloating next time. No, I, it, it just hurts. Like, I made oh. it, my first attempt to watch it, I made it ten minutes before I just, I was like, this is actually making me kind of ill. Yeah, it's not great. Uh, but we'll, we'll save that for next time. I would like to recommend people check out a game. And, I mean, this is going to be if you have our very specific fetish for this type of game. A game called Train Station Renovator. And that might sound crazy. Um, but remember how I said, and this is something you should take a look at, too, if you have time and can find it for very cheap. Because it's, it's very buggy and janky at the moment. But remember when I played that game, uh, uh, the uh, home House Flipper? Yep. And how I said that House Flipper has all of the mechanics that, uh, like, 100% has all of the mechanics. Uh oh I've been enslaved! If you could help me with that, that would be amazing. We're coming. I'm also getting hit by other dudes. Thank you. I'm about to die, so I'm gonna go heal myself. Uh, there we go. As I was saying, sorry about that. So, um, this House Flipper game, I said, if they would just use these mechanics and this structure in uh, Visser Cleanup Detail 2, they would have the best game ever made. And likewise, um, this is a step towards that, because instead of just being about flipping relatively small houses, you're, like, cleaning up large facilities. You're painting, like, you're washing away graffiti. You're painting, like, patching holes in the wall, painting them. You're cleaning up blood in one instance, because one of the train stations you are there cleaning in the aftermath of a football riot... Hmm. Where two different uh, gangs of football hooligans have spray painted their lo the logos of their team everywhere, and gotten into knife and baseball bat fights. <laughs> so there's like both, uh, you know, all the regular repair to do from people who trash the place, and like bloody messes to clean up. It's it's quite fantastic, right? And this game, uh, I, I encourage everyone to check it out. Not just for its own merit, this train station renovation, because it's a lot of fun, but also, and I can't stress this enough, because it shows how incredible uh, this or cleanup detail could be if they just modernized the gameplay elements. If they got rid of their ridiculous idea that, oh, well, we're going to make it so you can't, like, yeah, we don't tell you where the, the, the dirt is. And that is the thing I don't understand about Visser Cleanup Detail, is their determination to not tell you where the stuff you have to clean up is. Oh, I'm being shanked. I need yeah, and I'm, I just got cooked alive by a flamethrower. So I'm down. If you can rescue me, that okay. would be great. Sort of. No, well, do your best. I've got, I've got another, like, 30 seconds. There we go. Uh, so anyway, as I was saying... Uh, what fascinates me is these guys have totally cracked it, right? Because they've got, they've got this thing where it's like, so you look around and you're like, okay, well, where's the stuff I have to wash? Where's the stuff I have to clean up? And then you just press a button of your dirt scanner, which, by the way, having a dirt scanner makes way more sense in a, uh, in a viscera cleanup detail sci-fi crazy world, right, than it does in this game about fixing German train stations. But, like, you got this little sensor, and then it highlights all the stuff you have to clean, and then you go and clean it. And then when you're done cleaning, you have to replace all the stuff was damaged with new stuff. And you have to, like, every level has its own unique thing you have to do, like uh, refurbishing some trains, or removing a huge amount of graffiti, or in one case, putting on a hazmat suit and taking out toxic waste. Mm -hmm. It's like every single thing has a fun way to mix up the system, so I just... If you are like us, and small o obsessed with uh, Visser Cleanup Detail, this is a game you should check out, and if the Visser Cleanup Detail people ever hear this, this is the game you should pattern 
Visor cleanup detail too after, because you'd have the best game in the world if only it was playable. <laughs> yeah, if the physics weren't so janky. If the physics weren't so janky and it actually told you what you had to do, you'd have the best game in the world. Yep. All right. Uh, so that's going to be that. We will see you back here soon for us to talk about Picard. Oh, man. Uh, well, it has to be gone into. <laughs> yep. Uh, you, at least you understand that, right? Yes. Like, <laughs> uh, I just, I don't. I get I, it. Has, I get it. Alex Kurtzman belongs in prison. I know. I'm not even going to fight you on that. Like, throw the man in jail. It's that bad. Like, what he does, and I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk extensively about um, uh, uh, about Mass Effect when we're watching. Because how can you not, right? Yeah, also, EA, this is the one time where you have everyone's encouragement to be super litigious. I know! This is the one time we want you to go out and crush them. Just, But yeah, it, it was funny, and it's like... Um, uh, no, I, I was watching it uh, with Lazy Writer, and she didn't understand why I was getting so mad. And I'm like, that's because you haven't played Mass Effect. Yes, because it turns out they ripped off an entire, entire scene. Thing. Yeah. Not just one or two scenes. Like, the whole plot of it is a take on Mass Effect. <laughs> but that's something we're going to talk about soon. Uh, for now, I've been the Hidden Object Guru. Thanks for coming on this journey with us. If you had a good time and you'd like to listen more, there's a whole playlist of us doing this. A playlist of, you know, talking Narcos, talking, uh, of course, The Expanse, and our other favorite long lamented, its departure, The Tick, which is just incredible from beginning to end. Everyone should watch The Tick. Uh, <laughs> we will see you back here next time for Picard Talk, but until then, we're going to say au revoir.